So we're back. Um, I hope you learned a few more things um, in those videos, a little bit more than um, just what's covered in chapter one. Um, I think there are some things there that probably be worth coming back and, and watching later, especially as far as how the internet works, especially thing, that second half of, of part one and, and part two. Um, so there's are many things you want to come back and, and watch again later. Um, so let's talk a little bit about web browsers and, and what are the options that are currently out there. Um, there's quite a few different web browsers that are in use today. Um, anything from Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Edge, Opera, um, Brave. But it's good to know when we're building our websites to kind of know, well, what are those, which of those um, browsers are being used the most so that we can target um, the, the vast majority of users. Um, so if we look at kind of the current market share of the different browsers, um, about 62% of users are using Chrome, about 12% of users using Safari. Um, you've got Internet Explorer and Edge taking up about seven, Firefox, Opera. So, so really, we kind of look at targeting, generally we look at targeting our websites at those top um, say 90% of browsers, which at this point would mean um, Chrome, Safari, and and Internet Explorer, Edge, Firefox, those kind of ones. Um, simply because there are enough browsers out there, um, we can't necessarily test all of them easily, but we need to test you know the major ones to make sure that uh, things work well for our users. Um, if we look at the kind of the history over time of, of different browsers that have been popular, um, here's kind of a chart going all the way back to, I think, 2012 or so. So from 2012 to 2020, you can see that there's been a lot of shifts in what kind of browsers that people are using. So this gray line over here is Safari. That green line up here you can see is, is Chrome. So, you know, going back to... Um, 2010, 2012, really the, the dominant two browsers out there were really IE and Firefox. And you, but you can see since since 2012-ish, they've been, they've been coming down, uh, right? So, and, and Safari, both Safari and Chrome have been kind of on the upswing. So at this point, most of the browsers minus, you know, everything except for Chrome and Safari is kind of down in this world where it's really hard to say what's going to happen with it, but it's not used as much as, as all the rest. So what that means really for, for web development at the moment is, is if you want to hit 80% of the market, um, you have to make your website work on Chrome and you have to make it work on, on Safari. Um, if you don't hit those two browsers, if it doesn't work well in those two browsers, you're missing 80% of the market. Um, so that's, that's, just the reality of where we're at okay so you can pay attention to those those charts i've left the links for both this chart as well as that chart so you can follow up on you know where are they at and 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 where are they going as those numbers change um but that's that's the current state of the internet is is those is those browsers are kind of top um, talking a little bit about the languages that might be used on our back end, say we have an application server. Um, at the moment, the kind of the most popular ones are, are here. You can kind of see this is a, a Stack Overflow survey of what, are, what languages are people using. Um, this is language as, as a whole, as it considers both front end and back end. So there is a little bit of, of bias maybe in this because both of those things are lumped together. Um, but what we're seeing a lot is, okay, JavaScript is, is being used by most developers, both on the front end and the back end. Um, there's also a lot of back end Python, Java, C Sharp, PHP, Ruby. These are kind of the most, most common languages today. Um, historically, what we've taught for the back end has been C Sharp. Um, historically, that's been, that's been what we've taught. Um, 
however, kind of this semester and coming this this summer, I'm working on with with one of the instructors in Wentzville. I'm working on building out a new curriculum uh, for that third semester course where we talk about server side programming and, and back end programming. Um, and that new curriculum that we're working on is actually in JavaScript um, using something called Node um, to kind of get up to date or, or stay up to date with current industry trends, which current industry trends you can kind of see on this is the, is the JavaScript is on the rise. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed. Um, but there's, there's, that has changed over time. So if you look at what's in your textbook, you'll see a very different set of technologies. And, and in fact, even if you look at your, if you look at your textbook, textbook, JavaScript's not even on the, on the list of things that they, they give as here's something that you could use on the server side um, because it's it's come in so strong and and come in so some somewhat kind of out of left field um, so where does javascript fit into this mix so historically and in kind of originally javascript was only used for a few things um, nowadays it's used for a lot more and it's basically used for all sorts of all sorts of things. Um, but originally one of the most common uses for JavaScript were to do things called say image swaps and image and rollovers. So for instance, if you were to hover your mouse over a item in a shop, you see it might change from this picture where it's all folded up to this picture where it's all unfolded, right? So that would change using something called a, a rollover effect. Um, so that's that's one of those things that um, so usually one of the first things you learn about in terms of JavaScript, it's one of the first things that we did is changing an image when you roll over it. Um, so that's one thing we'll talk about later this semester. Um, really, um, it, it's, I think it's on the next slide. Really, there's a lot of other things that we nowadays use JavaScript for as well. And that's that's not just the only thing. It's not even necessarily the primary thing anymore. Um, so in terms of where it fits in, um, you'll remember when we talked about the kind of structure of the server and the application, um, we have HTML files over here that are kind of served by the web server. You ask for them, say, hey, I want index.html about.html, it'll go back here and grab it and come back. Well, you can also have JavaScript files. I mean, really you can serve almost any kind of file from a web server. Um, usually we want to serve files that are relatively small. Um, serving files that are like a few gigs, eh, maybe not the best thing to do through a web server. Um, but um, JavaScript files, Fine. So you just say, hey, I want um, main.js. It'll come back here, grab that JavaScript file, and return it to the browser. And which then the browser is where our, our JavaScript actually code, our, our JavaScript code runs as far as what we're going to do this semester. Um, what we'll be doing in third semester when we talk about full stack programming and, and back-end programming is we'll have JavaScript that both runs on the application, runs on the back-end in the application server, as well as having these JavaScript files that run on what we would call the front-end or in the browser. Um, but today, in this semester, we're just talking about the front-end, which is here, the front-end programming. Okay. Um, some common uses of JavaScript, interactivity is really the big one. Um, use JavaScript anytime you need to make your website interactive. So what that, what's that opposed, that's opposed to making a website that's just static, right? The user can look at the content, read it, um, but nothing really happens when they, uh, not, not a lot happens in terms of when they hover over things or, or um, click on things and, and such. Right. There's not anything dynamically happening. So to create websites that are actually interactive, um, that's where JavaScript really comes in, is for interactivity. Um, so we can use JavaScript for things like data validation. So you fill out a form to contact us or to create a comment, you know, to post a tweet. Um, we'll use JavaScript to validate that data to say, have you filled in all the required fields? Um, is your email a valid email? Is your is your phone number valid? 
Um, it can do all of those things, and that's that's a big part of that. Um, you can also use it for what we talked about previously. You know, image swaps, rollovers. You also use it for accordions, whereas you kind of have all this data, kind of here's a section, here's a section, here's a section, but you don't show all of it. So you click on one and it expands. You click on another, it collapses that one, expands another. That would be an accordion. Um, but the big thing we're using it now, data validation interactivity is still big. Um, the really important one now is something called AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript in XML. Um, X, XNA on the XML because we don't really use XML with it anymore. Uh, we use JSON with it, so a better name for it might be asynchronous JavaScript and JSON, um, but we still have kind of kept that acronym for the most part where we still talk about things as, as AJAX even though we've changed that X to a J. So, um, that's really helpful because what Ajax allows us to do is it allows us to update parts of the website. It says, okay, I want to get some data from the server. Um, whatever that data is, most often that's from the application server side. Um, we'll say, hey, I want this data or I want to go do this thing. It'll come back and it'll dynamically update the web page um, using JavaScript instead of doing a full page refresh, um, which means that it's a lot more um, snappy, feels a lot quicker. Um, it means that we can do a lot a lot more cool interactive things that we wouldn't be able to do with Ajax. Without Ajax. So let's look at an example HTML file. So if we're looking at that, um, we'll see that this is kind of maybe the normal structure of, of what that might look like. Uh, we'll dive more into the actual content, what all this, what all these tags and pieces mean here um, in chapter two. Um, but if you're here, you're just like, hey, here's the code, right? Um, so we can kind of see in there, there's this title, JavaScript jQuery. I can see so there's something H1 here in JavaScript in jQuery third edition. Something here that says IMG. I mean, I can maybe guess that that's an image of some sort. Um, and it says, okay, well, let's use JavaScript jQuery.jpg. There's some text here inside of this P thing. Um, and then there's another P thing, and it's got, you know, an A tag here, which an A tag is typically a link. Um, so, so that's what the code might look like um, when we're building web pages. This is the HTML code. Again, we'll dive more into this in the chapters upcoming and, and talk about this more specifically in chapter two. Okay. So if I was going to pull this code up in a web browser, um, you'll note that I've got some dot, dot, dots here. So this is not the entire code, um, but it's, it's enough to kind of see the general structure of it. So if I was going to pull this up in a web browser, um, this page is going to look like this. Okay. Well, I can see the general structure. I can see, okay, here's the title. Here's the header. Um, here's an image. Here's some text and some more text and, and oh, there's a link, right? So, so that HTML defines the general structure of the web page. Um, it doesn't really make it look pretty. Um, that's not the job of, of HTML and it doesn't do anything that's interactive per se. I mean, I can put in a link here that lets me go to another page, but that's kind of the limit of what I can do with HTML. Um, so if I want to make this look a little bit better, um, I can add in something called CSS or cascading style sheets. Um, so CSS is used to change how website looks. Um, the HTML defines the structure, the CSS defines the kind of look and feel of it. Um, so we apply that on top of the HTML. Okay, so first step to adding in CSS is typically we have it in another file. So we have a HTML file and we have a CSS file. So here I'm adding in a file called book.css, which is where I'm gonna store that CSS code. And I'm using this, this link tag um, to refer to it. So I'm gonna put that into the head tag and that's gonna say, okay, the actual CSS is, is over here. All right, so the CSS might look something like this. And we can kind of see there's a section here that talks about the body of the page, the H1 tag, the image tag, P1 
paragraph tags. So I can apply different rules and stylings to those tags that are in the HTML, okay? So if I apply that CSS on top of the HTML, so the HTML defined the structure of this page, but it really didn't make it look very good. Um, so I add this CSS file on top of it, these rules, and it says, well, here's how I want my page to look, right? So, so now that I've applied those rules, you can see that, okay, I've got a border around here. I've got the text showing up in blue, and I've changed the font. Um, previously, the, def you know, the default font for most browsers is Times New Roman, which doesn't look terribly good, especially on a website. It looks pretty canned. Um, so in here, we've changed the font to Arial, which is kind of the, the default font that we use for most websites, at least historically. Um, once we throw in Bootstrap, that may change a little bit. Um, but Arial's kind of the, been the historically the go-to one that's available on every browser and every device and, and looks good enough for most websites. So we've changed the font and we've changed the, the styling in, in a few different ways, including pushing this image to the left of the text. You can see it's kind of what we call floating to the left of the text. It's no longer in line. Um, it's no longer showing up as a big block. It's showing to the left. Um, and we've also increased the font size on that text. Okay. So all of those things we've done through the CSS file. So the thing to keep in mind to remember there HTML is used to define the structure. HTML is used to define the structure of the page. CSS is used to um, style the, the web page. Okay, it's made, used to make it look good. And then JavaScript is used to provide interactivity. Okay, it's to provide things that the user can do, you know, once the page is loaded. Um, it's code that actually, the JavaScript code, all of the, all of the codes we're talking about here, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript, all of that code is executed together in the browser. Um, it's not actually executed on the web server. The web server just says, okay, you want this file? I'll give it to you. It doesn't execute the code. Um, all of this code is executed on the browser, on the user's machine, whether it be their, their smartphone or Android phone, it, it, whether it be a tablet, whether it be their desktop. The code that we're actually looking at here is all going to be run on the end user's application after it is downloaded from the web server. Okay, so one website that you'll want to probably become familiar with is the Mozilla Developer Network. Um, these are the same guys behind uh, the Firefox browser, but they put out some really, really good articles and documentation that's freely available about a lot of different things when it comes to web development, um, especially the front end world. Um, so there's one tutorial here about, it's called Introduction to HTML. There's another one called CSS First Steps. Both of those I have put into perusal, so you can read those there um, and ask questions as you're reading through them. Um, but I would definitely recommend taking a look at their, their website. It's developer.mozilla.org. Um, and you because you can find a lot of resources there that will be helpful throughout this semester as well as the next one um, To actually write the code um, Typically kind of the simplest thing to start with is just text editor um, Because all of the things that we're, we're, we're talking about the the HTML code the CSS code the JavaScript code all of that is Just text right so you just need a tool that can write text um, built into your, let's say you're using Windows, um, there is a built-in program called Notepad which can do that. Um, there are pretty much every um, Mac has another program, I forget the name. Um, Linux typically ships with one as well. Um, so you, your, your operating system typically has one of these built-in, um, but it's maybe, it's generally not full-blown enough to do full-on web development with. Um, so what you generally want to do is, is pull down a more advanced um, text editor or tool to, to actually build the code. Um, so some good option on uh, Windows would be, say, Visual Studio Code, Brackets, Atom, Notepad++. Um, the key one that we're going to be using this semester will be Visual Studio Code. Um, that's 
that's what we're going to base all of our, our work on, and that's the expectation. Um, the textbook does use brackets, um, but we're going to we're going to switch over to Visual Studio Code as as that seems to kind of be the industry trend, um, the most popular tool that's being used right now. Um, so that's where we're going. Um, you can also also if you're building a full scale application. Um, you may want to use an IDE, which is an integrated development environment. So typically a, a text editor is just something that can edit text files and it doesn't necessarily have any more bells and whistles than that. Um, versus an IDE has a lot more tools and plugins that you can add on top of that to do application development. So some popular IDEs that are out there, Visual Studio Code, some people call Visual Studio Code a text editor. Some people call it an IDE. I think I'd lump it more likely into the, the kind of IDE side. It's, it's light, it is lightweight enough to see that like, okay, I can agree that yes, you could call it a text editor, um, but it really has enough tools into it, in it to be really a full blown IDE, especially as you start to add plugins in. So Visual Studio Code, Microsoft Visual Studio, um, if you've taken our second semester course, you've probably got an intro to Microsoft Visual Studio already. Um, NetBeans, IntelliJ ID, Brackets, Atom are other options out there. Again, Brackets and Atom, some people say they're, they're text editors, some people they say they're IDEs. It really depends on who you ask. Um, but so we'll be using Visual Studio Code for all of our things. If you're curious about kind of the popularity of, of different IDEs at the moment, here's a good, here's at least one link, one way source to look at to see well, what are some of the IDEs that people are currently using. Um, but Visual Studio Code is the one we're going for. Um, when we want to deploy our website, when we get ready to actually put it out on the internet, um, Typically for static web pages, we'll use something called FTP or Secure FTP, SFTP. Um, so there's a few different programs that can do that. Um, FileZilla is the big one that I've traditionally used for that. It works pretty well, um, primarily on Windows to do that. I think it's supported on some other operating systems as well. Uh, WinSCP, CyberDuck are also other options as well. I haven't really used either of those two, but I know there, there's some, some popularity around that. Um, also, most IDB, IDEs have FTP clients built in or available as extensions plugins. Um, so oftentimes, the, the best way to upload your web pages is really to just use the tools in your actual IDE that you're already using. Um, so FileZilla is one way you can do it and that will work regardless of what IDE you're working with. Um, but there's a plugin for Visual Studio called co Visual Studio Code called FTP Sync. Um, so that's the one I would point you to um, for this semester. Um, so that will you can just directly from within Visual Studio Code, you can upload it to a web server. So that's how I would do that. Is usually it, the the quickest and, and the most efficient way to do it is actually through your IDE rather than using a separate program. Um, but sometimes you do need to use that separate program, say FileZilla, to delete and manage, add, delete and manage files that are that are out there. If especially if something goes wrong or if there's an issue with your with your IDE, you may need to troubleshoot it with another tool. Um, so every resource that we have out on the internet is accessible through a URL. Um, so that URL has, has different components. Um, URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. Okay. Um, so the first part of that URL is going to be your protocol. Um, your protocol basically says what language are you talking, what, what language are you using to talk to the server. Um, so the most common of that are HTTP and HTTPS. Um, so HTTP is you're just plain talking to the server, asking for files, but it's not encrypted or secure, as you might say. So HTTPS, the S at the end means secure or SSL. Um, what it does is with HTTPS, HTTPS has an additional layer we call SSL, which does encryption. So it kind of keeps your, your data and the requests that you make to the server private. Um, 
the data that's going to your server and back. Otherwise, if you're just going over HTTP, anybody who's looking at the connection, anybody who's looking at the packets going back and forth can read it. It's completely unencrypted. Um, so HTTPS is, is an encrypted connection to that server. Um, that can also be FTP. If you're saying you're going over FTP, well, that could be the protocol there. Um, there's also a bunch of other protocols that can, can be put in that place, but the most common two that we'll work with are HTTP and HTTPS. Okay, again, with the S meaning that it's secure, is SSL involved, okay? The next part of the, of the URL is what we call the domain name. Um, so the domain name may start with www. That www is actually, at this point, completely optional. Um, basically, if you, if you leave it off or if you include it, you're probably going to get the, you're, you're generally going to get the same web page either way. Um, and some, some web pages don't necessarily start with www. They may start with something else. Um, so typically we, we leave that off wherever we can. So um, www historically meant World Wide Web. Um, that's what that came from. Um, but we, we leave that off most of the days now. So this would be modulemedia.com. I would generally take that into the address bar, to, bar is just modulemedia.com. Um, so that is the domain name. Now that domain name, as you saw in one of the previous videos, that domain name leads you back to an IP address. So every computer on the internet, um, in order for you to be able to talk to it, has to have a unique IP address, okay? Um, sort of, with the exception of like, there's, there's something called a port, which we're not really gonna talk too much about here. Um, but there's that idea that every server has an IP address, and so when you need to connect to the server, you actually need to connect to that IP address, um, but your browser doesn't know the IP addresses of that of all the servers on the internet. What it knows is, okay, I typed in this domain name, it'll go to the DNS server that's provided by, say, Google, or um, you're an internet service provider, Charter, AT&T, um, Verizon, and it'll go ask and say, okay, well, module media, what IP address is that? And it'll return and say, okay, here's your IP address. If that fails and you say, I type in an, a domain name that's not valid, well, then it's gonna come back with a, a DNS error because it couldn't find a, a mapping for that DNS name. Okay, so that's the, that's the domain name. Um, the next part um, is what we really call the path. And, and the book calls calls just this part, just the directory, um, the path. Really, generally speaking, when we're talking about paths on the internet, we mean the entire thing after the domain name. Um, so here, the path would be our work slash index.html. Now, what that typically means is that on the server, on the web server, that means that we're going to look into a folder named our work and then underneath that folder our work will find a file called index.html um, if i left off this directory then it would be at the root of the website okay um, and the other thing i can also do typically if i leave off the file name um, it will go to whatever the default file name is is configured to be for that server Typically, that's going to be index.html for just static content. So if I if I go into here with just typing modulemedia.com, it will go to the root directory and pull out index.html and serve that file. Okay. Uh, there's a lot more detail to this, so I've linked this uh, MDN article that will talk more about some of the parts of, of a URL. Um, I've also put this up on perusal, so you can read it there. Now, given that a URL, so URL is used to access any resource on the internet, um, whether you're accessing HTML files, whether you're accessing CSS files, JavaScript files, images, movie files, audio files, all of that is referred to in a URL. So one way to get to those is you can type in the URL in the web browser. Um, and the other way that you can get to there is say following links 
in a web page. So you click on a link that will then load the, the relevant URL into your, um, into your um, address bar. That's kind of the, the really the only two ways that most of your users will see. Um, obviously anything that you embed into a file, including like your CSS files, your JavaScript files, your images, video on that same page will just automatically be, it'll go make those requests for the cert, for the user, but not change what's, what's in the address bar. Um, I do apologize for the noise behind me. Um, that is my neighbor who is currently um, mowing the lawn. So um, there's a few different ways to get to a web page that is on your computer um, server. Um, you can either use the features in your text editor or IDE, um, or you can use um, the file explorer to go find them. Go go find it and double click on it. So for instance, if I look at, um, I pulled down the repo. So if you're looking at the, the base repo that I put out there, um, you should have gotten this through Google Classroom already, hopefully. Um, but if you pulled it down already, um, you'll be able to open it here. I'm gonna go into the Muroc HTML4E folder. I'm gonna go into book apps. I'm going to click on chapter one and we can see that there's some files here, right? So if I open up, say, JavaScript jQuery HTML, it will open up in my browser looking something like this, right? So I can do that just by double clicking it from the directory. Um, if I want to say, open it up in from here, the other way I could do that uh, it, or if I want to open up using Visual Studio Code, well, here's the path of that directory. I'm going to go up to here. I'm going to say in, if I open up, uh, let me just start from scratch. So start from Visual Studio Code. Um, going into Visual Studio Code, I'm going to tell it to open a folder and I'm going to navigate then into that folder. So Maroc HTML 4E, book apps, chapter one, I'm going to say select folder. Um, so that will now open that folder into here. Um, so what you'll see on the left is that Explorer. The Explorer shows you all the files that are in that folder. So I can see that there's a book CSS. I can see that there's a JavaScript, jQuery, HTML, and this JPEG, right? So I can open those just by clicking on them from the Explorer and I can look at the code for that. Um, some browsers, there is a way that you can you can go to file open, uh, file open file command. I'm not really going to go through those because those are usually not all that um, useful, to be honest. Um, usually it's easier to just find it on the file explorer or to use your IDE to get there. Okay. Uh, general naming recommendations for your folders and files. Um, you want to make sure that your all of your folders and files consist of only lowercase letters, um, numbers, underscores, or hyphens, and periods. That's it. Like, don't use any other special characters or foreign characters in your file names um, because it will potentially cause problems. Um, you also don't want to use uppercase letters anywhere in your file names because that can cause issues with um, file systems that are case sensitive, um, specifically Linux, which where is where a lot of uh, a lot of websites is hosted on Linux servers. Um, that can then be a problem because um, if you've named your file in in one case, but then you refer to it in your code with another case, it won't load, and it, it will probably work just fine as long as you're working on Windows. Um, and working locally, but then it will break as soon as you go put it out on the internet. Um, so it's a really good habit to keep everything when you're working with, with websites to keep all your file names and directories lowercase. Any, everything in your URL should be lowercase. Um, what that means practically is we don't use camel case for naming our files. Um, or Pascal case. Um, 
what we're instead going to do is we're going to separate words with underscore. So if this is the contact us, I wouldn't call it contact us with like an uppercase C or an uppercase U. I would say contact all underscore, I mean all, all lowercase, contact all lowercase, underscore us all lowercase. That's how I would type that out. Um, so separating words with, with underscores or, or hyphens is the better way to do things. Um, you typically want to include, want to give your file names. Um, you want your file names to indicate what the page actually contains in it. Um, that's really important for search engine optimization because the search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, do give, do t take some weight and some value in the actual name of the file. Um, it also is good for users remembering what the URL is is for those things, as well as let's say you want to put a link to it somewhere. It's a lot easier to spell that out if it's a a good um, readable short name. Okay. Um, if you want to view the source code for a web page, um, once you've got it open in your browser, you can look at the source for really any web page. Um, so if I go back out to my browser, and I'm going to say, well, let's go look for that MDN article about um, what is an H, what is a URL. So let's look for that MDN, what is a URL. Okay. So there's this article about URLs and such. Um, if I want to look at the actual code of this page, all I have to do is, is right click on it and I'm going to say view page source, view page source. Okay. That will open it up in another tab where I can see everything that is in that page, right? So we can see that this page has, has a good amount of HTML code in it. Um, now, specifically, if I want to look at the actual CSS code that's being used to style this, we can kind of look up at the top, see underneath the head, here's the start of the head, um, and then the, the end of the head is further down. But here we've got several of these CSS files, right? So I can see React header, off modal, React MDN, subscriptions, right? So I can look at any of these CSS files just by clicking on the link. Right? So here I've got the CSS for it, here I've got the HTML. So any web page on the internet, really, you can just look at the code. Um, you can see um, what is the code that goes into that. Um, now, using your, um, using Visual Studio Code, I do want to go over briefly what does that mean for our own code and looking at it in the browser. Um, so if I want to open this up in a browser, I've got this open up in Visual Studio Code. Um, by default, Visual Studio Code does not come with a, a web server built in, um, not provided, but we can integrate one. So the plugin that I want you to use is something called Live Server. So if I go over here to Extensions, I look for Live Server. Um, this is in the install instructions. Um, here's what I want to use. So live server, you're going to hit install. I've already installed it here, so it's not there. Um, but once you've successfully installed it, you'll need to restart Visual Studio. And then once you've done that, you'll have this button down here. It says go live and um, click to run live server. So if I click that, what it's going to do is it's going to run this website that I have open in just a local web server. So I'll be able to get to this from my machine. Um, this won't allow me to get to the website from anywhere out on the internet. It's just for me local to test it. Um, but that means that I can then open these files here. Now, if I had instead, um, you'll notice that if I started it, I didn't have a file open, it went to the root, right? So there's, there's no index HTML in this example. Um, so it didn't actually open something. If I were to instead start it, say, with the HTML file open, it will automatically take me there. Okay. So here is my my file. 
right? So this is my file without the CSS applied. I'm going to uncomment this and put the CSS back in. So there's with the CSS imply, applied. If I want to view the actual source, right? So we can see it over here. I can also see it in the browser. Right click, view page source. There it is, right? So I can see that, okay, here's my head. Yep, same head that I have in Visual Studio. Here's at least part of my body. Okay, that matches up. But then you'll also see, okay, there's some additional code the this live server plugin um, injects. Um, and namely what that does is it means that um, anytime I make a change here, it will automatically update the web server. So if I go in here and say 2020 and save that, doing say a file save or control S, you can see that it automatically updates it in the web page without me having to refresh it. Okay, so that's, that is really helpful. Um, so I can follow through and look at the CSS. Um, so the last piece that we want to talk about in this lecture is some of the common web development issues that arise. Okay, so they fall into five major categories. Um, first off is usability. Um, second is compatibility. And then we'll talk about accessibility, search engine optimization, and responsive web design. Um, so usability is the general, like, how user friendly is it? Um, you know, what are those kind of ex talking about? What are those expectations that the user has of your website? What's going to provide them the quickest path to get the information that they need, as well as how many clicks does it take to do that? Okay, um, how many actions does it take to do that? Um, cross browser compatibility is important as well, meaning that we want to make sure our website work equally well and work the same regardless of what browser the user is using. So if it, if it works in Chrome, ideally it should work in Firefox and work the same way. It should work in Opera and work the same way. It should work in Safari and work the same way. Um, oftentimes, because there are little nuances between the different browsers, um, there are things that we have to do to take that into account. So if, we, if we're just kind of not paying attention to that and only testing in one browser, we will probably run into some areas where um, things don't work exactly the same in another browser. Um, now there are some ways around that, especially when we talk about Bootstrap. Bootstrap does help us with that cross-browser compatibility, um, as well as jQuery when we talked about that as well, will help us with some of those issues there as well. Um, accessibility is another important thing. Um, most, you you know, some, us some users that we, uh, work with some of the users that are going to be able to use our website are going to have problems with well um, using keyboards using mouse using the mouse um, using um, being able to see right some of we might have blind users that are work that are trying to use our website and um, we also may have websites that cannot we may have um, users that are um, deaf and um, they can't hear any of the audio um, or just hard of seeing, right? Maybe they need some really thick glasses to be able to see your website at all. So, well, maybe the text needs to be big, bigger for them. Okay. So there's a lot of different accessibility things um, that we have to deal with. We'll talk about those a little bit more um, as things go on. Another issue is the search engine optimization. Really, any website that we built, um, we want the we want users that have never um, heard of our website to be able to find it on the internet. Um, so a lot of that, um, that, that idea of, of making sure that our website shows up on, on Google and shows up high in the search results, preferably on that first page. And um, that really falls under something called search engine optimization. We want to make sure it's optimized for the search engine so that our pages get indexed and, and ranked highly. Um, responsive web design is this idea that we want to build one website 
that works on all different screen sizes. Anything from a, your 4K monitor um, all the way down to your little iPhone 5, right? You want, you want your website to be really usable on any different, on any different form factor. Um, that does mean that things may have to move around a little bit. Maybe things are not exactly in the same place. Um, but being able to adjust those things without creating two completely different sets of HTML code is, is kind of the goal. You know, we don't want to have one website for um, our, our people with 4K monitors and or another website for people with desktop, another people for another website for people with tablets and a, and a finally a fourth one for people with um, phones that becomes a bit of a problem a bit of a nightmare so we'd rather bundle that all as one website okay so going back to usability um, if we look at this website this is this is a website that's got reasonable usability I would argue that it's maybe not high usability but it's 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 decent I think there's still a few few too many things going on up here in this this top part of the website but but it's okay um, so this is the example that they give um, so some of the things to kind of pay attention to here you see they've got the logo up top and the brand typically the expectation is you can click on that logo and that will take you to the home page of the website okay that's an important thing to kind of get back to home um, you've got a search bar in here. You've got some additional logos and items up here. A shopping cart. It's really usually if you're doing e-commerce, that's a general convention to have a shopping cart up in your top right corner. Um, and then they've got a few different layers of navigation. So for instance, here under shopping, they've got, okay, well, what category? You know, do you want to look at furniture? Do you want to look at rugs, decor, et cetera, et cetera? Um, they've got a sales banner and then here we go into actually looking at some of the items so we've got the items down here we've got different filters we can s sort by um, best selling or, or popular or just alphabetic things like that um, sort by price um, and then we've got something in the middle here so here's our kind of our header for the page this is saying well we're looking at blue floral throw pillows and then between here, we've got something called a breadcrumb trail. So this kind of tells us how did we get here. Um, so this gives us a way to get back. So we're inside of throw pillows, which is inside of decorative accessories, which is inside of home decor, which is inside of home goods. So if I want to kind of track back to get back to how I got here or know where I am, um, that uh, breadcrumb trail can be useful. Um, so using a lot of these kind of conventions, um, helps the user get oriented to your website um, a lot quicker. Um, even if they've not seen your website before, they've probably seen a breadcrumb trail or a brand logo or an ad bar on some other website. So they have some familiarity and expectation for how your website's gonna work based on other websites that they've used. Okay, so important things for usability to keep in mind. Um, Generally speaking, your users want to be able to find the information they're looking for as quickly and as easily as possible. Um, they don't want to have to scroll through 100 pages of text. They don't want to have to look through 100 different pages to find the specific thing that they're looking for. They want to be able to get to that information as quick as they can. Okay, So anything we can do to speed that up and to reduce the amount of scrolling, um, the amount of clicks that they need to do, um, the better. Um, so generally speaking, um, us your users are going to scan the page. They're going to be start looking at from um, at the top and say, well, here, where is the category? Where is the section that I'm looking for? Right. So start with the nav bar and say, OK, I am looking for, well, about us. OK, so it's in the nav bar. I can go directly there. I want to find about I want to contact you. OK, I can go to the nav bar and go down there. So so typically speaking, the most important things we want to keep up at the top of the page. And that's where you'll usually find those things in what we call a nav bar or navigation bar. Um, you just don't really like to scroll down. Um, if you've heard the mantra, if you're on the second page of Google search results, 
you basically don't exist, right? Because they'll most users scroll down to the the end of the first page and like, oh, I didn't find it. All right, let's try a different search term. Um, some pa some users will look at that second page. I sometimes look at that second page, but you know, I'm pretty sure you know from your own experience how often it is you just stop at that first page, right? Um, it, or or how far you you have a certain limit for how far down you'll scroll a page scroll down on a page before you go to the next one before you go to the next thing so typically speaking um, they'll kind of look through your page and follow links until they find the specific information that they're looking for um, and the expectation there too is, is if they don't if they get to a page where it doesn't have what they want or 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 whatnot that they want to push back in their browser um, to get back to that previous page. Um, so that's one of the things to keep in mind is is there are some things, especially when we deal with with JavaScript, that can cause issues with maybe that back button working. Um, so we need to be uh, we need to be careful to make sure that we we take it, that into account and we don't necessarily break their back button. Okay. Um, so general guidelines for improving usability. Um, we want to present as much information as possible above the fold. Uh, now above the fold is traditionally a, a graphic design or marketing term. I mean, it actually comes from, from newspaper. Um, when you kind of think, well, what, what, where is there a fold in, in a web page or in technology? And if you're talking about, um, a, uh, an iPhone or, or, or a smartphone or a, even a desktop, what fold are we talking about? Well, that fold traditionally referred to the fold in a newspaper because um, you would get it kind of where it would be um, the top half of it would be here. You would see that on the um, on the um, the counter wherever you were buying it and then the bottom half of that front page would be underneath the fold right it would be not visible right so if you wanted to make something pop on a newspaper it need to be top of the front page right top of the front page because bottom of the front page you don't see it until you pick it up and look at it and unfold it right um, so what we mean with that in kind of we've we've adopted that into the web design world in the sense to say the fold is the bottom of your screen it's where if it's below the fold it's you have to scroll down to see it so anything that's above the fold is stuff that the user sees immediately when they open that page anything that's beneath that fold is things that they have to scroll down and see um, so it's really important to make sure that we put the most critical information up above that fold and that we give the user some indication that you want to scroll down, that there is more information below. Because um, otherwise, users may not know that there's anything beneath the fold. Um, that can be a common um, mistake with users like, OK, I didn't see it. Well, you had to scroll down. Um, so sometimes that does mean um, giving the user some indication that, oh, this page continues. Um, honestly. So uh, we want to make sure that we group related items together, um, but we also want to make sure that we reduce the number of groups on the page. Um, so for instance, if we're talking about groups and we're looking at this example, right? So this up here would be a group and you can see all the items in that group. They have an icon and they have text underneath them. This is a group as well and you can see each of them are, well, okay, that's a... <coughs> A category of items in our store as well as there's a group here for um, the different filters um, so all those kind of things um, are important is grouping things together rather than having them them scattered um, all across the page um, we also want to make sure that every page includes a header um, that tells the user what page it is and, and what to expect on that page. Um, so that header should appear at the top of the page. And we also typically want to make sure that every page on our website includes a navigation bar that lets them, them navigate the website, you know, get to the major pages of the website. So those are important kind of 
general usability guidelines. Um, you want to make sure that you're also using current navigation standards, conventions. Um, so for instance, that the logo in the top left goes to your homepage and the shopping cart goes to your shopping cart. Um, so you want to make sure that you're following those conventions that you would expect for your specific domain that you're building websites for. So if you're building e-commerce, that's where the shopping cart comes in. If you're building a different um, domain, then the conventions would be different. Okay. Um, as far as process compatibility goes, um, generally speaking, you want to test um, your, your page across all the different major browsers. Um, historically, that's meant testing it with not just the current version of Internet Explorer, but older versions of Internet Explorer as well. Um, if you're building a website for general consumption nowadays, it, testing against older versions of Internet Explorer is not as important um, nowadays. However, if you're, say, building something for um, certain industries, especially healthcare, um, there are a lot of users in this space um, that are maybe locked down to older versions of Internet Explorer. Um, so that is something you need to be aware of depending on your domain. You'll, you have to kind of do that on a per, per domain, per audience basis. Some, some audiences are using older versions of Internet Explorer, so you do have to test down with, with different versions of that using emulation. Um, you want to make sure as you're building your website, you're using features of HTML5 and CSS3 that are broadly supported by, by modern browsers. Um, there's a way to look up some of that compatibility. Um, it's called Can I Use? You can look up that website on the internet um, and it will tell you on a, on a very granular level, hey, this thing, is what, what browsers support it? Um, and so for those things that are newer or not supported by all browsers, um, you may need to put in some workarounds um, to make it work for them. Um, sometimes that means using additional CSS settings. Sometimes that means putting in some additional HTML tags and attributes or uh, if all else fails, using some JavaScript to provide that fallback. Um, so that's, that's the thing to keep in mind as far as cross browser, com browser compatibility. You want to make sure you test it and then find out what are those things that broke in different browsers because typically there will be something. Um, there are a few different um, accessibility, a few different laws that have been put out regarding accessibility, um, namely ADA, um, Americans with Disability Act, um, there's a part of the Federal Rehabilitation Act that matters as well, as well as um, part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, I maybe know a few things from these, but I'm not terribly familiar with these different laws um, as far as accessibility is concerned. So um, that may be something that you have to look up more um, on your own time. I don't really have much to say on these. Um, different types of disability to keep in mind. Um, some people have visual disability. Um, that can range anywhere from blindness to just being hard of seeing. You know, maybe they need a magnifying glass of, of some sort or, or thick glasses, bifocals, to just like where I'm at where I just, I just need glasses, right? So, or being able to see with your natural eye. So there's a varying range of, of visual difficulties. Um, another visual difficulty that fits into there is, is color blindness, right? So you wanna think about, think about that as well. Um, some users may have trouble, for instance, red, green, color blindness is pretty common. So if you're putting things in there where you need to know that it's green to know that it's good or whatever, and that's your only indication, or if you need to know that it's red and that's your only indication that there's a failure, um, that may be a problem. So you typically want to use icons and text as well in, in addition to color to convey information and status. Um, so hearing can also be an issue if you have any audio that you're trying to use with your website. Um, not too many websites nowadays use audio except out of, outside of video. 
Um, so that may not be a necessarily a, much of a problem for you. Um, but some of that can be resolved with things like subtitles on videos or if you're providing strictly an audio file, it may be a, here's a transcription of the, the interview or whatever audio that's in it. Um, motor um, disabilities can also be an issue. Um, so some users may not have access to their hands. They might have to use their feet um, to actually navigate through your website. So keep that in mind. Um, they might be using foot pedals um, or, or other devices. Um, some users might only have, they might be missing a finger or two. So the other things, you know, things to keep in mind as far as, you know, how they interact with your website may be a little bit different. Um, cognitive disabilities can play a matter too. So, uh, cognitive disabilities are definitely a lot harder to, to deal with and work around sometimes, um, what that does mean is that you you keep your especially the things that are above the fold the top of your screen your top of your pages as simple as possible um, so that means keeping your um, keeping every item in your nav bar pretty self-explanatory um, pretty short um, pretty brief um, as well as adding a title to the top of those pages. Um, the easier your website is to navigate just for your random um, user that, um, that hasn't been given any sort of briefing, hasn't been given any sort of introduction to your website, um, the more you're gonna be able to work around those cognitive difficulties. Um, so last issue we wanna talk about here is responsive design. So if we look at the Muroc website, this is the example that they give. Um, if you just go to the home page on a desktop, it looks this way. If you go to it in a, a mobile phone um, in portrait versus landscape, you can see that you're getting slightly different versions of the website, right? Um, you're basically getting the same website, right? But it's been optimized to work to work better on different um, form factors. So for instance, in here in the desktop version, you can see that there's a server number, contact us, and the search bar that immediately appear. Well, those things are, are gone, they're hidden, right? So you can still get to them by clicking that search icon. You can still get to it here by clicking that search icon. Um, but some of those things are, are, are hidden, right? Um, they're not immediately visible. Same thing with my account and my cart. Um, you may have to click that, um, the hamburger icon, the triple bar, in order to um, get to those additional menu items. Um, so that's kind of what, in, in a nutshell, what responsive design looks like. We build one website, but we have it dynamically change what's visible and where it's at so that it works better on different form factors. So that's that's what we're talking about. So responsive web design is is referred we generally referring to websites that are designed to adapt gracefully to the screen size or, or form factor. Um, you want to typically keep the overall look and feel the same or consistent from one screen size to the next, um, but it, but you are going to see things um, shift and move around. It may take an additional click, for instance, to get to searches, the search, or making take an additional click to get user account. That's okay. Um, that's just a, a necessary sacrifice. Um, but what you want to sacrifice is those things that are maybe not used as often is, is make them a little bit harder. Um, and, and especially following conventions. So the user can still find them, you know, without having to know that it existed in another version of the website. Um, some tools that we can use to support responsive design are media queries. We'll talk about that with CSS later. Um, scalable images where um, they dynamically adapt to different screen sizes. Um, that's especially using things like SVGs, um, which are vector images and scaled it better, um, as well as flexible layouts. Um, flexible layouts are really the most important part of <coughs> 
responsive web design. And those flexible layouts, um, especially combined with media queries, are, are really what makes um, modern uh, responsive web design work and, and makes it actually relatively easy um, to support different um, devices. Okay. So in this lecture, we've talked about how to load a web page into your browser, um, especially one that you uh, have locally, um, whether that be through just double clicking it on the file system or by opening it through Live Cert or in uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, we also talked about how to view the source code of a web page directly in your web browser just by, say, right clicking and view source. Um, we talked about some of the components that go into that web application, namely the, the browser or the client, um, as well as the server and the, the web server and the application server that, that may be behind that. Um, we talked a little bit about HTTP requests and HTTP responses. Um, HTTP request is the idea of, of, you know, the data that you send to the server, the response is the data that comes back. Um, and as you saw in one of those videos, that's typically composed into two parts. You've got the headers that are the top part of that request or response, and then the body that is underneath it. Um, we talked a little bit how to distinguish between um, web servers that are static versus web servers that are dynamic. Um, the big difference being there is, is a web server just directly serves the files that you give it. Um, versus an application, if you're building a dynamic web page, then you'll have a, an application server that sits behind and then generates the, the HTML as you need it, um, rather than having the HTML around for every page on your website. Um, we talked about a little bit about the purpose of HTML, which is to structure your web pages. We talked about CSS, which is used to style your web pages. And then we talked about JavaScript, which is meant to give interactivity to your websites. Um, we talked a little bit about how to deploy a website to the internet, namely using FTP, um, whether that be through FileZilla or through a plugin in Visual Studio Code. Um, we talked about the components or the parts of a URL. Um, we talked about, you know, it starts with a, a protocol such as HTTP colon, and then you've got the slash slash, and then the domain name, followed by the path. And that path typically includes a file name, okay? We talked about briefly just kind of an overview of some of the development issues that you may run into as you're building websites. We talked about usability. We talked about compatibility. We talked about accessibility. And we talked about SEO. And then we finally talked about responsive web design. Um, so that's the end of this first lecture over chapter one. Again, I apologize for the lawnmower in the background. Um, your reading assignments are up on perusal um, and your homework and lab assignments are up on Inside Rankin. Um, so you can start those at your leisure. Um, remember those are due by the end of the week. All right, thank you. I'll see you again for chapter two.